There is a question that every magic user eventually asks, and it is a wonderful question to answer. What is the weave? We know this, we've studied this, but for the purposes of the lecture today it warrants a re-explanation. The weave is the web of magic by which spellcasting is possible. It surrounds the world, suffuses nearly all realms, and is generally a surface of calm with the undercurrents of chaotic and wild magic. It is also what Mystra is made of, what Mystra is, and arcane, divine, and primal casters gain their power through their own manipulation of the weave, or from higher powers using the weave as an easy way to communicate and send their power to the chosen practitioner. It was the sake of ease that caused an issue for the divine casters during the spell plague and aftermath. The weave collapsed, save for the weave anchors, and priests, clerics, and paladins could not hear the guiding words of their gods. Indeed, for many it seemed that the gods had abandoned them. Perhaps they were even killed in the tumult. But in reality, the gods had become so accustomed to using the weave as their primary source of communication that when it went away, they had forgotten how to send power directly, using their own wills as the conduit. It may seem implausible that the god would forget, but it's a good thing to remember that while a god may be orders of magnitude more powerful and miraculous than anything a mortal may ever attain, they're not perfect. By design, decree, they cannot be omnipotent or omniscient, and as they can be forgotten, so too can they forget. Eventually they discover new ways, or old ways, to reach their worshippers, but the event serves to show that the weave is both a thing of immeasurable beauty and incalculable importance. And there is a question that was asked by every magic user in the fourth age, as measured by changes to the weave, but is almost non-existent now. What if the weave dies and cannot be brought back? What would an apocalyptic sixth age look like to the world? It's possible that all that would happen is we'd revert to the rules of the fourth age, but there are other possibilities out there in the multi-spheral universe. Our weave is empowered by the natural energies of the world. Sunlight, tidal forces, tectonics, kinetic motions of wind and earth and water all contribute to the recharging of the weave. As it is tethered to the material world, there exists another world where there is no weave, where magic is drawn directly from life energy, primarily from plant, but also disgustingly from animal and humanoid. This world's energy comes from the sun, dark and crimson, and dying, and the natural world suffers as wizards are rarely preservers of that energy, but more often willing to drain the world of life energy to power their spells and magics. These are the defilers of Athos, and the focus of this, our next lecture in the Plane Shift series. In the beginning of Athos, there was nothing but a vast ocean dotted with a few marshlands and mountaintops known as the Blue Age. The ocean provided all and a vast halfling civilization floated on the top of the serene and savage waters. These halflings had neither magic nor psionics to call upon, but they had created a society more sophisticated and advanced than anything that presently exists on Athos. Their cities dotted the endless sea spreading their influence far and wide, and making them the undisputed primacy of the world. And yet, all good things come to an end, and as usual, it's because people got involved. Sorry for the cynicism, but current events are surely, surely getting to us all. For the longest time, untold centuries, the ocean provided, and the halflings improved upon their life-manipulating technologies. The world of the Blue Age was wondrous and alive and it bowed to the commands of the halflings who inhabited it. While the knowledge the halflings possessed was fast, it was far from complete. The halflings of their capital city of Tiraji, center of inspiration and discovery, tried to increase the sea's capacity to sustain life, so that the number of creatures and plants it produced could be doubled. The experiment went awry, however, and instead the seas began to die. A fetid brown tide spread across the waves, killing everything it touched. 
Many of the halflings panicked and looked for ways to protect themselves. Some built great subterranean strongholds, others fled to the mountain forests. A few, however, remained in Tiraji, struggling to find a way to cure the dying sea. But eventually reality sank in. <laughs> there was no way to save the Blue Age. If life on Athos was to have any chance at all, the halflings had to stand aside and let another age begin. With the brown tides sweeping across their ocean, source of all life causing it to slowly die, in desperation the halflings created a tower that manipulated life energy itself. Aiming this tower at their sun, they changed the light from a brilliant blue to a radiant yellow. The brown tide, being a creation of life magic gone wrong, was sustained by the blue light, began to die under the concentrated yellow light. But as the tide receded, so did the percentage of the ocean, and land appeared from below the surface. During the time of receding waters, new creatures appeared at an amazing rate, finding life in the shadow of the halfling's glowing tower and spreading across the land. Some creatures survived, others disappeared in an instant, but the land was generous. Animals and monsters alike continued to file into the world long after the devastation of the brown tide. Vast forests grew across land that was once submerged, and still more creatures crept about the land. The Green Age had begun, and almost all halflings in their shame abandoned their technologies and went into the wilds, leaving the world to the new races. There were no druids in this new age, and only a small number of elemental clerics practiced their arts, and instead, new religions were born, dedicated to new gods who made the young and superstitious races feel protected. These gods, with their opulent temples and elaborate rituals, filled the spiritual needs of the new races, but produced no true clerics. The real power of the age was psionics, which developed through the mutations created by the power of the halfling tower. Almost every living thing had some psionic potential, and throughout the Green Age, the art of psionics was fostered to amazing heights. Most people started as wild talents, but soon true masters of the way were teaching the principles of mind and body to the masses. Psionics provided the means for all manner of conveniences, and set a high standard of living for those who dwelt in the great cities. A special group of beings appeared during the receding of the waters. These beings had the characteristics of all the new races, plus great powers that set them apart. They were called the Pyrene. Whether this race sprang into existence by accident or was the direct result of the manipulation of the nature masters is not known. There were a few of them and they lived an extremely long time. The Pyrene hid themselves from the other races, content to stick to their own agendas and stay out of the affairs of the rest of the world. But one Pyrene was different. He called himself Rajat, and while he had much in common with the Pyrene, he was also deformed and ugly of both heart and body. In his youth he had high ideals and great plans, but these became as twisted as the body and spirit that housed them. During the earliest days of the Green Age, Rajat explored the world. He travelled the wooded lanes of the floating ivory platforms of the Mindbenders, wandering from the majestic towers of the human cities to the sylvan citadels of the elves from the gloomy metropolises of the dwarves to the tiny pockets remaining to the halflings. Rajat discovered magic about 8,000 years ago, a strange and mystical science that had heretofore not occurred on Athos. He could only accomplish small things at first, but he eventually found a place of power where he could experiment in secret. It was an idyllic glen, surrounded by forests of green and intersected by a river of glistening blue and it was located at the base of the jagged cliffs. Here, secluded and hidden from his fellow Pyrene, Rajat learned to draw energy from life itself to power his magic. But in doing so, the meadow turned into a dire fen, a swamp of foul proportions, and the first sorcerer was born. The first sorcerer took possession of the now abandoned Tower of the Halflings, altering it to fit his own needs. He plundered the place, and soon its secrets were his own. With the power of the halfling tower to aid him, Rajat refined his control of sorcery into two spheres, preservation magic and defiling magic. He then sent out a call to potential students of the art, practicing the secrets of preservation magic during the day, but at night, secretly teaching a very select group the destructive and powerful defilement magic. Eventually, Rajat sent all but 15 of his students away. With the nature of manipulating powers of the halfling tower, he turned these 15 students into his champions. Drawing energy from the yellow sun, 
Rajat imbued each of his champions with immortality and the ability to draw magical energy from living creatures through the use of obsidian orbs. As the Halfling Tower channeled the sun's energy into the champions, the yellow orb changed. It turned crimson and dark, signaling the beginning of a new world. Though many know the now modern world as Athos, all know of it as Dark Sun. The magic used by wizards in Dark Sun functions much the same as for a wizard in Faerun, using the manipulation of power to create complicated braids that turn into spells. Arcane magic is capable of the same feats as magic here, but with an important difference. We manipulate braids of the weave which is universal and renewed by natural processes. That means we can be far away from everyone in a janitor's closet, surrounded by mops, and we could still cast fireball. Oh, only don't, because those rooms are tiny, you will die, and then who will pay for the mops? But put a dark sun wizard in that same room, and they probably can't cast spells, because you need life energy itself to cast any sort of arcane magic. I say probably, because the memorization of spells itself can be the point at which life energy is used. So unless that wizard stayed the night in the janitor closet, it's possible that they've suffused with the right amount of power already. It doesn't matter what type of wizard they are, they use life energy. Preserver versus Defiler is instead two sides of a method philosophy coin. Preservers have a deep and abiding respect for the life forces of the world. They, they take great care to balance their gain of magic against the cost of life energy so as not to create adverse effects. Preservers only take enough life energy from plants to produce the spell effect, being careful not to take so much that the neighboring plants can't recover. Defilers, on the other hand, care only for power, reveling in it as it courses through their bodies. They don't care about the life forces that are lost when they weave their spells of magic. The nearby plants wither and die when the defiler draws power for their spells, and the fertile soil surrounding them turns to sterile ash. Defilers wield magic with no concern for their dying world, indeed defilers are much to blame for Athos's current state. Over the course of 50,000 years since the first champions arose, defilement magic has annihilated most of the world's oceans in green, with vast basins of silt and ash remaining. The few remaining patches of forest and jungle in the known world are fiercely protected by the halfling tribes, sadly now reverted to primal instincts only and to preserve the wizards and the druids of this likely final age. Defilers care only for the now, for the power experienced firsthand, the convenience of their way of life, trusting in the fact that the world will survive at least as long as they're alive, and once they're dead, they'll move on to a glorious afterlife. The troubles of the natural world don't concern them, because they're only interested in themselves. Thank goodness this kind of thinking is only found in a world far, far away from us. When a defiler casts a spell, all vegetation in the sphere around them turns to ash. The radius of that sphere depends upon two things. The abundance of vegetation in the area, and the level of the spell cast. For example, the defiler Emil Tiger 2 casts a lightning bolt, a third level spell while in the scrub plains. The area of ash around them will be 4 yards. In the next round, they cast a magic missile spell, expanding the radius of ash by 1 yard bringing the total of burnt earth to 5 yards. In the third round, Emil decides to unleash an advanced illusion, a 5th level spell. Since this is the highest level spell cast from this location, the area of ash is recalculated. 5 yards for the 5th level spell, plus 1 yard for each of the two lower level spells cast, for a total radius of ash of 7 yards. Though only plants are destroyed within the radius, living creatures are caused great pain. Any being in the radius of Defiler's magic must trust in their own constitution or become slowed. No matter how high the resulting spell casts though, the pain can never keep a character from performing an action during that turn of combat events. Alternatively, as mentioned above, wizards can draw life energy when memorizing their spells at the start of the day. Preservers require 10 minutes per level of each spell to complete the memorization process. Defilers require 5 minutes per level of each spell. So, a 5th level Preserver with, a four, with 4 first level spells, 2 second level spells, and 1 third level spell needs 110 minutes of uninterrupted study to memorize their full complement of spells. A 5th level Deviler with the same spell complement would need only 55 minutes. 
Defilers benefit greatly from this method of gathering magical power. For example, since a defiler knows the terrain they're in when they sit down to memorize spells, they'll be certain as to the number of spells they'll have after making their intelligence check and can plan accordingly. Also, plants turn to ash when they tap them while memorizing the spells, which means that they're able to cast the spells later without overtly betraying the fact that they're a defiler. The ash created by defiler magic is black and grey, completely devoid of life or life-giving elements. Nothing will grow in an area of ash for one year. The ash itself is very light and usually blows away, leaving behind a lifeless circular scar on the ground. Even with the ash gone though, the defiler's magic has leached all life-giving nutrients from the soil, so that an area defiled may take many years to recover life, if it ever does. Use of magical items never causes a defiling effect on the surrounding grounds. However, defilers who create magical items do cause destruction at the time of manufacture. Both groups must hide what they are from the common people of Athos. Most people don't know or care that there are different kinds of wizards. They see only the cruelties and evils of the wanton destruction of the land around them by the defilers. For this reason, all wizards are hated and feared. If any wizards reveal themselves to the common crowds, they can expect violence or even death to be visited upon them. Is it possible for a mage in Faerun to become a defiler? I think it is. Not all mages use the weave after all, and there was, perhaps still is, the Shadow Weave. A creation of Shars so that her followers could continue her work without Salune or Mistra being able to keep tabs on them. And there used to exist a 10th level spell that slaughtered all living sentient creatures within one mile giving the cast of one extra year of life per person killed. I think the ability to draw directly from life energy is possible also because Athos magic functions much like ours, which precludes at least the possibility of it working here. To do so would make you a pariah of both the gods of magic and of nature, however, albeit one hidden directly from their sight. You would be a monster, forever hunted by the good forces of the world, but also a scourge to be feared in a tool for the evil powers out there who would likely offer you anything and everything for you to be their instrument and my goodness i am not good at talking people out of something if you become a defiler i'm going to give you an f in this class and then expel you via catapult coming up next time we'll continue the divinity lectures and sometime next week we'll discuss the magic of a rather crafty little world of mine until then to be continued